Welcome to another edition of Fixing the Money Thing. I'm Gary Cassie. Have you ever driven down the road and saw a beautiful house and you said, I wish I owned that? Or you drove by a field, maybe 1,000 acres of uh, wheat that was blowing in the wind, ready to be harvested, and you, I wish I owned that. Your phrase has already given you a key, a major key to changing your life. You know, you understand something that you can't enjoy something you don't own. And that's true. You'll never enjoy something that you do not legally occupy. That's the topic of today's program, because if you'll learn how to take territory, learn how to occupy territory, you're going to change the standard, the, the ability to enjoy what you occupy. You say, oh, Gary, I don't know how to do that. I, I, I didn't either. But you know what? There are principles and steps you must take to get to the place of destiny or occupation where you actually enjoy the benefit of owning it. In today's broadcast, I'm going to take you to a series that I began at Faith Life Church where I laid out the 10 steps to taking territory. No, you can't short circuit the process. They're in order. 10 steps to taking territory and enjoying the good life today on Fixing the Money Thing. Now, we're starting a series called Taking Territory uh, this month. This is the first session. And to take territory, well, you'll never enjoy territory you don't occupy. So we've got to move. You have to change. Everyone loves change, right? Oh, yes, we do, right? So 10 steps to take territory is today's message. So get your pen out. You need to know what we're talking about today to get you down the road. Judges chapter 6 is a chapter I've taught out of since we began the church. I love this illustration. I love it because it's so clear of the steps that you must take to win in life. So let's dig into the first uh, verse of chapter 6 of Judges. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites... Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels, and they invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Number one on your list, write these words, something's wrong. In Europe, if you were going to take a step like up steps or down steps in the states we say watch your step in europe they say mind the gap if you've been there it says mind the gap so let me ask you a question about this story israel of course came out of egypt when they crossed the river jordan they were given an inheritance of land now remember they had been slaves for 400 some years and to own their own land was their prosperity agriculturally that was their prosperity so they have that right. So legally, they own the land, but now we find them hiding in mountains because the enemy has pressured them off of whose land? Pressured them off of whose land? So legally, that's their land, correct? So the first thing you have to ask yourself is what is legally mine and why am I not enjoying it? There's a gap. You say, well, how do I know it's legally mine? The Bible says every promise of God is yes and amen. And if you see your life dysfunctionally compared as God describes life, there's a gap. Would you agree? Now, you can put up with it. You see, people learn dysfunctional ways of thinking. For instance, they can live on credit cards forever. They've learned to live with credit cards. Credit card is their security. And they'll go for years and years thinking nothing of it and also not dreaming or actually thinking it's possible to pay cash for a car or a house. They have trained themselves, trained themselves to put up with dysfunction as a way of life. To them, it is completely normal. But until you measure it against a standard, you do not know you're missing it. And so the Word of God defines the standard. The first thing you have to do is, there's something wrong. That's our land. We should enjoy. You see, the Bible says they planted, and when they plant, they expect a harvest 
and you are doing the same thing. You, you have good intentions, but you're just not getting the harvest. Instead of saying, oh, well, oh, my, you need to say, why not? Something's wrong. Mind the gap. There's a reason why, okay? You need to ask. That's the first thing. You're not going to change something you accept as normal. You've got to find the problem. Find the problem. Mind the gap. All right? What is legally yours? Number two, what did they do? Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Good move. Until you mind the gap, you're, you're kind of surviving. But when you find the problem, you need some help. You would have already fixed it if you could have. You need to cry out to God for answers. He, he knows everything. You need to ask him. You need to cry out to God to help you know what you don't know. And God's response is step number three. In verse number seven of the same chapter, it says, when Israel cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a what? A prophet, a prophet in those days carried the word of the Lord. Now you don't need a prophet to come and prophesy to you what God's will is because you have the Holy Spirit in you. Prophecy in the New Testament confirms and edifies. It does not lead. We are led, the Bible says, the children of God are led by the Spirit of God, and we have that inward witness on the inside. But in those days, they had prophets. So God sent, God sent them a word. The prophet carried the word. He sent them a word who said, this is what the Lord, of, uh, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Everyone say correction. correction. You need corrected. Now you, you may think that's a negative term. That is not a negative term. If you were heading for a cliff going down the wrong road, would you want someone to correct you with the correct information? Of course you would. The Bible says righteous people embrace correction. We, we want to be corrected. And so the Holy Spirit needs to correct some things or teach you some things. Essentially, he has some knowledge that you need to have. So you cry out to the Lord, you listen, and he's going to speak to you either through the word or through the Holy Spirit, he's going to speak direction to you. Dorinda and I were in dysfunctional debt for nine years. It was not fun at all. It was just survival. And when I ran out of every option, no one had any more money to lend me. Every debt was canceled, had no options. I fell across my bed and I cried out to God. And he answered me and said, the reason you're in this mess is because you do not know how my kingdom operates. You've never taken the time to learn how my kingdom operates, Gary. You're doing things the world's way and wanting me to bless it. But I have another system. You've never taken the time to learn my system. So you cry out, God will speak to you. He'll begin to mentor and correct and move you back on center. He'll also have to teach you how his kingdom operates. His kingdom is a kingdom of integrity. And many of the things you've learned in the earth realm in survival lack integrity like asking for someone to pay you cash under the table to avoid paying taxes. Some of the practices you are now doing may not be righteous or they may not have integrity. During this phase, when God began to teach us his kingdom, when he said that to us, we began to explore and God began to teach us his kingdom. We began to see things happen. He led us to begin a business. It began to prosper somewhat. We began to see change. And uh, two of the main problems we had in those days were our cars. They should have been buried a long time ago. They were a mess. You know, they would smoke and sputter, and we just were glad they started. And we had a car accident maybe a year before this time period I'm talking about. So we knew a settlement was coming. And we looked for a car to replace, the, uh, replace one of these cars. And Saturn, remember GM Saturn just came out, and they were to compete with the Japanese imports. You remember that? I may be 1990s in those days. And so we went and looked at these Saturns and because I was in sales driving every day, I said, I, I, I think we need a Saturn. So we, we drove them, we picked the color and the settlement came through $22,000. Now I remember at that time, 
to have $22,000 in our checking account was like just, we are billionaires. You know what I'm saying? That's a lot of money when you're just coming out of nothingness, right? We are so excited to go get this car. Now, previous to that check being issued by the insurance company, two months before, I was with my dad. And the nine years that we were living without money, my dad was my bank or my lender, however you want to call it. When I needed money, I went to dad, okay? And uh, I didn't know this, but dad was actually keeping track of every dime he gave me. <laughs> I didn't know that. And two months before I was talking to dad, I said, dad, you know, I so appreciate all you've done for us. And I'm going to, I mean, we're going to make it up to you. And he goes, well, that's 20. He named the numbers and that's 20,000. He says, I've been keeping track. I've got it all written down. It's $20,000. He said, but don't worry about it. He said, you don't have to pay me back. He said, I'll just have it noted in my will that when my estate is dispersed, I'll have them take $20,000 out of your share. I thought that was pretty good. I mean, really, you know, I mean, really, it took the weight off. You know what I'm saying? You know, that was, I thought that was very generous. I thanked my dad for that. Thought that was a done deal. That was awesome, dad. Thank you so much. So we were... We got the check, and we were about to go buy that Saturn. I mean, to go, go buy it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, uh, go pay your dad. You owe your dad 20000 I said, yeah, but you heard me. He, he says, I don't have to pay him back. <laughs> <laughs> He'll take it out of the estate. And this is what God said to me. He said, if you do that, he'll never see your integrity, and he'll never see my faithfulness you pay him back. Otherwise, every time your car drives down the street, he'll think, there goes my $20,000. You are kidding, God, right? You're kidding. Now, put yourself in our shoes now. We had been struggling for nine years. God had spoken to us about the kingdom. Things are moving, but we need a car. My dad does not need the money. He has a lot of money. $20,000 to him, not that much money. He doesn't need it. We need it. You're kidding me. Pay my dad back? I mean, pay my, he doesn't need $20,000. No, but Gary, you need to pay him back. Not for him, but for me. That was a struggle. You ever wrestle with the Holy Spirit? Oh, that was a struggle. Finally, we, you know, we said, yes, we've already played it our way for long enough. And God had been dealing with us. We've got to learn his ways. Called dad up. And this is how he answered it. He usually answered this way. How much money do you need this time? Is that how he answered it? No, Dad, we're not coming to borrow money. We're coming to pay you back. Now, he knew that I knew the amount because he told me two months before the amount, 20000 And he was shocked. I could hear silence in the phone. Well, I'm coming over, Dad. Well, okay. So we got there, and the, the event is just, you know, vivid in my memory. I walked in. Dad's on the couch. I walk in and say, Dad, I want to pay you back. And he said, well, you know, that's $20,000. I know, Dad, I want to, I'm going to pay you back. Pulled my checkbook out, went to start writing the check, and Dad, I could see tears in his eyes. And he said, no, wait, no, wait a minute, he said. Tell you what, you write a check for $10,000, i will call the rest a gift. Now, think about what I was thinking. <laughs> $10,000 from $22,000 leaves $12,000. How much was my car going to be? $11,500. Are you with me? Okay, Dad, that's awesome. Here's 10000 And we drove straight to the Saturn dealership and bought our new car, but we were willing to give that up. So you got to pass the integrity test. See, God is your sword. He's got to train you in this system where you've been training to trust credit cards or other... other you, he's got to train you that he is your source. And in this process of learning this... The prophet speaks, the word of God comes to you, and he's going to begin to train you, his system, how to prosper. That sounds exciting, right? Yes. <laughs> You'll get a hold of it yet. <laughs> Number four, there's this guy named Gideon, and he lives in this nation. And so, remember, the nation of Israel is surrounded by an innumerable army that has ravaged the land, and this name guy named Gideon is mentioned here in verse 11. So the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abrazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midians. 
when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Really? Number four, know who you are. Don't let your circumstances or your past define who you are. God is with you, Gideon, mighty warrior. Gideon, the one that's hiding, who's hiding, who has a strategy to survive in the midst of conflict, hiding, not confronting, hiding. He's a, he's a mighty warrior. Well, let's read on past that, that verse. Verse 14 is step number five, right? Go in the strength you have. Go in the strength I have. Now, everyone write it down. Go in the strength you have. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Gideon said, well, why didn't I think of that? But, everyone say the word but. 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 <laughs> That's what you're going to say, not, right? Uh, they're innumerable, by the way, God. Have you have counted them? It's me. I'm, I'm, let me tell you about myself. How can, I, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. The Lord said, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Wow. Now, obviously, Gideon could not go in his own strength and take on the innumerable army. So what did God mean by that? Which takes us to step number six. Verse number 25. That same night, this all happens, say the same night. Same night. Means right now. Everyone say today. today. Before I leave. Make some changes. All right. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as an offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his, what, family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. What was Gideon to do in his own strength? He had to deal with the familiar. 